Welcome back to another episode of Black Facts. Today, I'm very excited because we're gonna be talking about men's reproductive health with Dr. Jonathan Bryant. He's an attending urologist at Kaiser Permanente. Hi, Dr. Bryant. Hello, Michelle. I'm so happy to have you on. I wanted to have this conversation for quite some time and in celebration or honor of um, June being, you know, Father's Day and Men's Health Month, I wanted to talk about men's health and reproductive health in particular. Um, I know you already know that men don't typically go see their urologist unless there's something wrong or, um, you know, the only time they seek care to deal with their reproductive health is if they're not able to get someone pregnant or something's going on. So well, I'm going to be very clear. Men like they'll come to see us when they have erectile dysfunction. This is getting you know, okay. the elephant in the room right off That's the bat. Okay. <laughs> erectile dysfunction. So it's okay. something that um, is is you know very prevalent in America, and I'm and I'm happy to you know sort of address the, those issues. Okay. So why um, should men care about the reproductive health other than trying to have children? Well, when we talk about reproductive health, I'm going to just sort of rephrase. And because reproductive health gets very, very specific to okay. actually um, procreating or getting achieving pregnancy. So I think that a, a bigger, just as a more global picture that is probably more relevant for, for mo the majority of us, which reproductive health takes a small component of that is just um, the genital urinary system or just mm -hmm. men's health in general. And so, okay. um, men, like you said, men typically don't like to go see the physicians for regular appointments. I myself don't like to go see physicians, so I, 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 I understand. And usually or what I see, not say usually, but when I do see men in my clinic um, is either because they have some sort of um, issue with their PSA or their prostate, mm -hmm. is urinary issue, or they have problems with erectile dysfunction, or they have something like a kidney stone, or they have blood in their urine. Um, those are that's generally the you know what we see uh, you know more commonly. So um, we can start off with um, with urinary symptoms. So should a man be concerned basically if he's having the urge to urinate frequently? What is that a sign of? So it, everything's the, it, it, it often depends on the age. So if a, um, um, someone's younger and they're having urinary issues, it's more more or less either because they have bladder dysfunction. Um, but if they're older, um, and I say bladder dysfunction means their bladders may be hyperactive or they're drinking a lot of fluids or they're, or they're um, partaking in caffeine, which is a big trigger for urinary symptoms, urinary urgency frequency, not only for men, but for women as well. So caffeine is a stimulant and just like it stimulates you to be aware, it also stimulates the bladder. So if you're at any age, if you're drinking caffeine, um, you will have um, uh, an overactive bladder. Some, sometimes you have to, to feel the need to urinate more. Um, as you approach the age of 50, um, oftentimes um, urinary symptoms are common with um, the need to urinate frequently. Waking up more than, I tell patients, if you're waking up more than three times in the evening, you're not getting good rest. Um, sometimes you'll have a slower urination. Men um, will notice like, man, I'm standing on a urinal. And you know, it's I'm standing there for a long period of time, and and it's taking me long to empty my bladder. I can't make it to the restroom without you know leaking on myself. Sometimes men will restrict the need for um, hydration be, when they're going on long road trips because they'll have to urinate frequently. So those are oftentimes secondary to um, what we call um, outlet obstruction, where the prostate, which is a small gland that sits beneath your bladder, and it it um, it wraps around the urethra and it's a gland that is it's a, re, it's a, it's a reproductive work and it helps um, it helps with the uh, secretions of the you know your, your, your seminal uh, vesicle fluids or the fluids that you use that is used to help nurture the sperm so to speak when you're um, ejaculating so um, so the prostate grows is something that happens as you get older the only way it doesn't happen is if you are a, a eunuch <laughs> but other than that you, you know you're going to have prostate enlargement, and it can manifest itself in um, the urinary symptoms that we just described, that, you know, aforementioned, the urgency frequency, slow urination, waking up more than, you know, more than, you know, two or three times in, in the evening, um, you know, some some urinary incontinence or leakage, 
so to speak. So that could be managed one or two, you know, one way is oftentimes they'll see their primary care doctors, they'll talk about these symptoms and you and good primary care doctors know the symptoms, they'll start make patients on medication that helps to relax the muscle that's sort of, that is enclosing the urethra and causing the symptoms. And that relief of the smooth muscle relaxant will help men to urinate better. And that's very effective. Before the medications, a lot of men were just going straight to a urologist and they were, um, they were, you know, just giving surgical options. So oftentimes by the time I'm, someone sees a urologist or in my, my practice, uh, a lot of times they will been, would have been started on, on a medication to try to help those, those relieve the prostate pressure. Um, it's just almost like basic plumbing. And if that, that, or sometimes men don't like to take medications or they can have side effects from the medication. So um, if that's the case, then we have some, some alternative options, which is urologists are surgeons and, um, we have surgical options. And now with newer technology, we have procedures that allow patients to go home same day. And, um, if they, and, and less invasive, um, and then we have, you know, from the less invasive to the, you know, pretty big surgery or reasonably moderate to, you know, large surgeries to help depending on the man's anatomy, depending on their symptoms. But it is important if you're starting to have these symptoms that you try to address it, because what happens over time is if you let it go, your bladder, just like any muscle, will get can get weak and get tired. And sometimes in the worst case scenario, it can not allow you to empty your bladder as much as well. And then you're walking around with with a, a stagnant, you know, pool of urine, and that can cause urinary tract infections. That can yeah, cause- that's what I was going to mm-hmm. ask you. Wouldn't some of those some of those issues end up causing a UTI? Yes, because you're not emptying your bladder all the way, yeah. and that makes you feel like you. And so it's a it's a it's a, um, a definitely something you want to make sure that you, you address and that your bladder is still maintaining the ability to empty, com- you know, you know, fairly completely. Because if you don't, at some point, some patients, you know, they'll stay away and they'll go into what we call full urinary retention. And that's when the bladder just gets tired and it just won't generate enough energy to empty the urine. And then then though, when it, once you get to that point, there's not a lot of, of anything you can do except maybe have a catheter placed or a catheter that goes directly into your bladder. Or you have to learn how to cath yourself, which a lot and cathing yourself is putting a, a small rubber tube inside your penis every, you know, four to six hours to empty your bladder. So you don't want to get to that point, you know? So if you can prevent that by just, uh, you know, intervening earlier, that's, that's going to be good for you. And in larger scale, if you're not able to empty your bladder, your bladder's sole purpose is to protect the kid is to store urine and to keep store urine at a low pressure. So that it doesn't go, so that pressure doesn't go to your kidneys in which if it goes to your kidney, it causes pressure on the kidneys and then you can go into kidney failure and that can lead to dialysis. And that's a whole, that's a, that's a wrong you don't want to, you know, to be in. So, so just addressing the BPH is a common term or benign prostate hyperplasia or hypertrophy, hyperplasia is the more accurate term or enlargement. Um, You want to make sure that you're, you're, you know, you're seeing your primary care and they can refer you to a urologist if you're not, if the medications are not working for you, or if you just want to have something more um, definitive, more, more surgical intervention. Okay. So, now you talked about the prostate. Um, let's talk about that a little bit more. When sure. should a man go in to start getting screened for? Um, so that's a very, very good question. Prostate cancer uh, is 30 years ago, we were treating all prostate cancer basically the same. Um, because it was a cancer that you can't really feel. Um, and when you, when men were getting it, prostate cancer, they were developing it at a, you know, oftentimes at later stages, but the PSA, the prostate specific antigen was developed to help screen for prostate cancer. And it was good. But the thing about it is that it was a very sensitive test, meaning that it would screen not only for, it could be elevated or, um, you know, the numbers for the reading could be higher, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have prostate cancer. So it was not specific. It's just sensitive. Uh, and, and so the problem with a, something that's sensitive is that you tend to overtreat a lot of or address a lot of benign conditions or to find a lot of benign conditions, which is OK. And so we were, um, you know, treating a lot of men for 
or doing a lot of biopsies on men that we that necess- didn't necessarily have have cancer. But um, fast forward now, um, we you know over the last you know ten to fifteen years, a lot of men were getting PSAs, and then from the PSAs being elevated, they're getting prostate biopsies. And so then prostate biopsies were coming back positive for cancer. And so cancer is a very heavy word for most people, for anyone. Mm-hmm. No one wants to hear I got cancer, right? right. So, um, and especially if you have a family member that died from cancer, any type of cancer. Um, but what we realize is that not all prostate cancer acts the same. So prostate mm-hmm. cancer is a very- mm-hmm. Can I ask you real quick, can we back up a little bit? So say I go in, well, not me, but say, you know, the family member of mine that, yeah, yeah a male um, goes in, what should he expect? Like, what am I, what is, what's he expecting when he goes in to get his prostate checked? So initially the screen, yeah. So yes, back. So the screening process was start at the age of 50 okay. generally. However, depending on your, um, your family history, um, you know, you may want to get the prostate cancer screening test earlier. If you have a first degree relative, a brother, father, uncle, you um, that have prostate cancer, you 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 may want to start getting it, or it's okay to get the test or request the test as early as forty. Okay. So get early as 40, 45. Now, if your PSA is less than one at the age forty, then you're you're pretty safe to not necessarily have the test every every year. You probably can go every other year if it's less than one. But if it's if you're forty, because your PSA is going to increase. This test is, is, is going to increase as your prostate grows because the prostate makes the PSA. And so as you get older, your prostate grows is making more PSA, and that's normal. What you don't want to see is a spike in the PSA where the velocity or the, the every year, say it goes from two to like six in a year, and you have, and you haven't had an infection or you're just going in for your regular test, that raises eyebrows because the velocity or the, the rate that should go up should increase should be no more than one a year. So if you're 40 and you have a PSA of four, even though it may say that's normal, that's not really normal. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and so, you know, you know, so depending on, and if you're, you could be 80 and say your PSA is before there was a flat rate, everyone over four was considered to be abnormal. But as we know that as you get older, your PSA is going to get, get, um, it's going to be, more elevated. So a, a 70 year old PSA is should be higher than a, someone who's 50 years old. And then an, another thing is that at a certain age, which is really about 75, we um, the recommendations from the American Urological Association uh, after looking at all the men is to pretty you can probably you're safe from not having any um, abnormal um, adverse death from prostate cancer at age 75. So 75 is usually typically um, men stop screening for prostate cancer. There's a caveat to that though. And that's based on prostate cancer is, is slow growing, meaning that even the, the usually the worst, the higher or more aggressive prostate cancer is gonna be, it's not like pancreatic cancer, it's, it's a slow growing cancer. So generally the rule of thumb is that on average men you know, live up to like 80, 85, mm-hmm. if you're fortunate. The, the cancer that you have is you're going to probably die with that cancer and then die from the cancer. So um, that's why 75 is generally we stop screening for prostate cancer. Now, with that being said, I, I'm not an ageist. I believe, you know, if someone comes in, they're 75 and they're, they're you know, saying I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro next right. week. <laughs> or, uh, you know, my mom, my I'm going to visit, I'm gonna yeah. visit my mom and she's, you know, 100 years old. Then, you know, that person, they have a longer lifespan. So it's probably reasonable to screen that person. Okay. So now let me break it down again. Cause I know a lot of men in my family, they don't talk about this. They don't really want to know. So I want to make sure we're very clear. Now, if they're going in to get a PSA, is that a urine test? Is that a blood test? Is that an actual exam? What is it's that? It's a blood test. It's okay. a blood test. Okay. It's a blood test. It doesn't take much. And, and everyone should get a baseline PSA at the age of 50. Okay. Um, so what 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 does the digital rectal exam? So a digital rectal exam, it, it it's used complementary to the PSA. It's falling out of favor because it's subjective. So okay. the PSA is a little bit more specific. 
a, a good physician is going to want to examine you. They want to do a good general urine. They want to look at your penis. They want to look at your testicles. They want to do a rectal because you can find so much more on the rectal exam. You can actually get an idea like, wow, this patient's prostate feels pretty enlarged. So I'm not as worried with an enlarged prostate on a rectal exam if their PSA is a little bit higher. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so I use that that rectal exam to give me some if they have, um, you know, a rectal structure, if they have a rectal, you know, a mass in their rectum. The, the tone of their rectum. So I'm getting a lot of information with just, just my finger, you know? Okay. Um, I know it's not the most comfortable thing, but it doesn't take a, a, a lot to do. And you can, you know, you can clear a lot of pathology with just one rectal exam. Um, although it's not, it doesn't, it's not, if you do have a firm, hard nodule and your prostate, generally your PSA is going to be super high and you'll know, and that kind of confirms that then goes more towards staging. But I know the, the rectal exam is falling out of favor with a lot of, um, first line, you know, primary care doctors and, and, you know, nurse practitioners and PAs, because the data doesn't show that it really correlates a lot with prostate cancer, but urologists tend to do it because you can find so much more information um, with the rectal exam regarding rectal tone, the prostate size, um, you know, they, and then we're looking at their, your, their penis and their testicles, looking for hernias. We're doing all that. And it takes literally about two minutes to do everything like that. So well, I think it's a good idea for the, for men to, to get that, um, it's, it's not the most comfortable Can you exam. say that again? Because I know, once again, a lot of men in my family, that's why they don't go. Because they're like, no, I'm good. I I don't, I don't want to have that done. But now that you're expressing all the different things that can possibly be identified as a result of doing, you know, the rectal exam, I think they need to understand the importance of coming in and getting it done. Yes. I mean, women don't like getting cervical pap smears no one likes to get no one likes to be probed and prodded right. no one likes that but it's just in life sometimes you gotta you know do some things you don't want to do to you know get get um, the results you want to get so it's um you if you have insurance <laughs> you're paying for insurance you're fortunate to have um, a, a, a physician that's interested in your health um you know then it's then it's it's, it's, it's up to you to choose to to have that exam you, you, you got to think of your body as 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 your vehicle and you know you want to treat your vehicle most men treat their vehicles want to treat their vehicles they get it in for oil change they get the tires changed they do all these things for their vehicles but they don't want to take care of the vehicle of their life you're you're, you're born with one vehicle thank you thank you for saying that because that is so true they will take care of their vehicles make sure that all the everything is checked out so it's running smoothly but they won't do the same thing in our health we only have one temple right we only have That's one right. body like you said one vehicle that we can use throughout this life so we need to make sure that you know we're taking care of it um I, oh did you want to yeah so speaking of vehicles i was going to say that's a good transition to the next um component the next pathology that, that we see is erectile dysfunction. Mm. Uh, did I answer your questions about the PSA yes, and BPH? Yes, yes. Okay, Thank prostate you. cancer screening. Um, as we're talking about our vehicle of life, the our bodies, uh, and erectile dysfunction is, is important on so many levels. Obviously, it's important for someone's intimacy and the, their intimacy wellness. Um, it's important for it, for themselves, and it's, 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 it's good to be able to have um, a very vital and functional sex life. It's, uh, you know, we you should not take it for granted. And and one of my best friends, he's a cardiologist, Dr. Batiste, Healthy Heart, you know, give him a, a shout out in his plant-based um, mission. Um, he and I talk about this a lot, uh, about men's health um, and erectile dysfunction, because erectile dysfunction is not really, and I tease him, I said, it's not a urological condition, it's actually a cardiovascular condition mm. because, but it's the, it manifests, it's a manifestation of a, of a cardiovascular condition. It's a barometer of someone's overall health. And I tell, and this is the opportunity that I really like to take time with, with patients because they've come in for erectile dysfunction, but then I, I'm able to say, I'm glad you're concerned about this. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that it's tied with something pleasurable because uh, if you're not getting good blood to your penis for intercourse, that means eventually you're not getting good blood to your heart. So let me break it down even, even further. Um, the penile artery, the artery that delivers blood to the penis is about four millimeters on average. The coronary artery is, uh, is which delivers blood to your, your, your heart um, is nine millimeters. 
you know, mm-hmm. and and all and also the you have your you know your arteries that deliver blood to your your cerebral arteries that deliver blood to your brain. If you're not getting blood to that little four millimeter arteries because you have plaque buildup because you have uncontrolled um, high blood pressure, which causes the plaque, to, you know, the, the vessels to harden or diabetes, which damages the vessels and high blood pressure and diabetes. You don't feel them until you start having um, collateral damage or you start not getting good blood flow to these and or and organs like the kidneys. If you start getting bad blood, not getting enough blood to your penis to sustain, to get an erection and to sustain an erection, that that's a good sign that you're going to be more likely to have a cardiovascular event. Um, And they've done studies on this. Men who've had heart attacks or strokes report that three to five years before they had that heart attack or stroke, they started experiencing erectile dysfunction. So if you're out there and you're starting to notice that your erections are not as as not as strong or are not, you know, not lasting as long, or you're having a hard time having an erections, um, then that's a, a good, a good, a good sign that you, you need to start making some, you know, some really basic lifestyle changes because lifestyle changes as Dr. Batista will attest, diet and exercise will do so much better. I know we live in a society where everyone wants, you know, your doctor to do something right now. So you're, you're better, right. but really it's a commitment on, um, on the patient and their loved ones to start making those lifestyle changes that will make your heart more efficient, that will um, help keep blood flowing to your, you know all your organs, not just to your penis, um, but to your kidneys, um, to your brain, um, so uh, to your toes. <laughs> People lose toes from diabetes and so forth. I'm not laughing because it's serious. No, it's um, but um, so and that doesn't take the body is so resilient and. Um, whatever you believe evolved, created so well that it is, is very resilient. And all we have to do is invest a little bit of time every day. I tell patients, yeah, you know, invest as 24 hours in a day. And you have to take, if you take, you know, an hour a day for that investing in your vehicle, mm-hmm. um, that's going to um, parlay you into a realm of, of good health and you'll age better. And, and I, I just recently came I just I just went on a bike tour um, and I saw people in Europe who were, you know, older riding bikes all around because they're always doing activities um, to keep, you know, to stay healthy. And, and that's going to keep you keep things moving. So it's very important that you and you have to do an activity um, that you, you know, while you're doing it, it doesn't feel very pleasurable. It doesn't take long. It's just a high intensity interval exercise, like something that's going to make you sweat. People say, well, my job. You know, I, I I'm very active in my job, Doc. I, I, I mean, I'm there. I'm every day. I'm doing this, and I'm just tired when I get home. I said, but your body is smart enough to to will have compensated for that activity. So you need to challenge your body to work even more. So your body's like, what's going on, right? Mm-hmm. So like this extra blood flow, this extra heart pumping is going to really pay huge dividends for your ability to you know achieve erections, along with some you know better lifestyle changes. I'm not, you know. I'm not telling everyone that you have to make perfect choices, but you want to make better choices in your diet. You want to eliminate smoking. Um, smoking is 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 probably the biggest contributor to a lot of you know um, disease in America. And it goes from cancer to you know coronary vascular disease to erectile dysfunction. So this eliminating smoking that's gonna you know. Now we got to clarify that one. Are we talking about cigarette smoke or are we talking about? Well, cigarette cancer? smoke is 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 is. Obviously bad. I know that uh, you know we have our people, people who you know say well marijuana is a, is herbal and is natural it's from the earth. Um, I haven't seen any studies about the marijuana smoking as of yet, as far as that um, is concerned. But I, I, I I'm sure if you're an excessive marijuana, no, no, I'm sure if you're an excessive marijuana smoker, you're not going to have the energy to do some of the things you need to do to stay to stay active. I know you get. Well, I understand you get the munchies and all this other kind of stuff. So uh, it can decrease your motivation. So um, I don't want to comment too much on, on on the marijuana smoking, but definitely cigarette smoking um, is not healthy for your erections. And I tell patients, you know, just put that hour in a day with you can combine it with some cardiovascular, some core, but do it. Do that activity like you want to have sex. If you want to have sex, you got to have to, you know, you, I, we can give you a Viagra or you know, a phosphodiesterase type five inhibitor, because I'm not 
trying to um, you know, just yell out one one right. pharmaceutical. But Viagra is obviously that's what everyone knows about Viagra, Cialis, um, you know, those Levitra, those type of drugs. They help, and I'm not saying it's wrong to take them because they are very effective because they help encourage blood, they help get blood to the to to the penis and to those. But they have side effects. There's some studies going out how it's it's um, recently that there may be impactful to your vision. Um, oh, wow. So, uh, so it's, it's important to try to do your part as naturally as you can. <laughs> um, and if that just means, you know, going for a brisk walk where you're walking, you're sweating every day, 30 minutes with your loved one, um, I think you should, you should do that. If it's, you know, doing some sort of, you know, bike riding or swimming, something that's going to make your body feel, um, you know, challenged every day. If you can, I know some days are rest days, but you want to do at least five times a week. So at least five. Okay. And, I, and you shoot for every day. So if you miss a day, it's not a big deal. Okay. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good time to get your mind clear. And so it's so many, so many benefits to just being active um, with erections and so forth. I agree. So um, I appreciate you kind of sharing how there's a correlation between erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular you know, issues or potential, potentially cardiovascular issues. Um, so all of you men out there, I hope you're listening. If, you know, you're having these challenges, I hope you realize that there could potentially be something bigger going on and you take care of yourself. I wanted to speak to you to the last thing I wanted to ask you about vasectomies. I know that's another trigger oh, word yes. for most men. <laughs> they don't really want to talk about you know, getting a vasectomy. So can you, can you share a little bit about that? So vasectomies is a way of um, eliminating your, your um, ability to get to achieve pregnancy um, with, with, with common, you know, sexual intercourse. The vast deference is the tube that connects your um, testicles, which produce the sperm to the ejaculatory ducts and, you know, your urethra. So um, it's a simple procedure um, in which we you we numb the scrotum where the where the where the that where the vast deference travels. We numb it just like with um, lidocaine or a type of lidocaine medication. Just like if you're going to the, the dentist, we inject it. You feel that little pin prick, and then we pull that vast deference up, and we and then and I say we urologists or some family practice does it as well. Um, they ligate that. They cut it off that tube. Uh, and they tie off the end so that now that the, the sperm can't travel and you, you don't achieve pregnancy. And some men will say, oh, you got a mess. It has nothing, nothing to do with your ability to get erections. Let me be 100. I want to understand that. Understand that it does not impact your erections. It's, it's part of the urinary tract, but it's, it's, it's the reproductive tract, but it's not part of the, the pathway that allows you to have Matter of fact, you'll have better sex if you have a vasectomy because you're not worried about getting someone pregnant. So, I, so if anything is going to, you'll have, you'll have, you never have to hear the. I mean, when you're at a, when you're at a certain point, you don't have to hear those like, "Hey, honey, we got to talk." Um, you know, I'm 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 pregnant. So if you if you truly want to um, try to um, eliminate take you out of the, the the you know the the denominating factor and and it's and it's and it's not a hard test to do. It's probably easier than then your your spouse getting a um, a tubal ligation, um, and it's reversible. Believe it or not, it's a reversible. If you some men will come in, they'll have a they'll be in a second marriage or a second relationship, or decide later on to have uh, you know they want to have have a, you know children. You know it's it's reversible, and um, so it's it's a procedure that uh, that's effective, and it's and it's being a you know it's being a sort of a compassionate, empathetic. Um, to your, to your, to your, to your, to your loved one, to your, yeah. to your, to your lady. Um, yeah. it, it does, it's, you, you'll be sore, um, for a few days. Uh, and then after that, you, you, the soreness goes away. You won't even, you won't even recognize that you, that you have it, except that you, and you ejaculate the same because your sperm is only a very, people say, well, I won't be able to ejaculate. You'll still be able to have good ejaculation. Your sperm is only a very small portion of your ejaculatory fluid or of the semen that comes out when you're having intercourse. So you won't even notice a difference with, with your ejaculation. Um, so it's a, it's a good way to, to, to prevent, achieve, um, to prevent pregnancy when you're at a time in your life where you don't want to have, you don't want to have, be a father. Right. <laughs> so, um, 
I know um, there is a there. People feel like you're taking you, you, your manhood is not compromised in any way. You have same testosterone levels. Your testosterone is not affected. It's a it's 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 just um, it's a safe, effective, you know, procedure. I so appreciate you. You've hit on so many major points that I have talked to, like I said, men in my family, only because I want them to be healthy, right? I want them to live long lives. And so I've asked them questions about, you know, um, their, you know, erectile function. If it, is, it, is it working properly? Have they gone in to get their prostate checked? You know, are they going in just to get their preventative health, you know, annual appointments are they are they keeping those are some of them you know interested in getting a vasectomy so you have hit on all the major talking points i know that i've discussed with the men in my life and i so appreciate you clarifying that you know all of them are it's it's best to get get them checked and to make sure that you stay on top of your health or in your terms and stay on top of your vehicle make sure that your vehicle is running appropriately You've dispelled some myths that I know that I've heard in responses to the questions that I've asked about, you know, not being able to get an erection after a vasectomy, not being able to, you know, perform as they would, they think that they, you know, they perform. So I really appreciate you, like I said, just clarifying some things and really speaking facts um, so that the men in our lives can make sure that they're taking care of themselves and they're doing the best to to ensure that they have optimal health. And just to, one more thing I like to emphasize, sometimes I do have, we do have patients that are doing things that are a healthy lifestyle, but they still need to have help with erections. So I don't want to leave this, this um, I don't want to leave the, the opportunity just to, to briefly discuss Dr. J's four Ps for the penis, okay? okay. The four Ps for the penis, I mean, for men who have erectile dysfunction, if you're employing, the things we talked about, the diet and exercise component, and you're doing it consistently, you sh and you don't notice the difference than, than the pills, which is the first P. That's the okay. first thing we start. We start from least invasive to most. Then, uh, then we have the pump, a vacuum erection device. Oh. And then we have the pen. <laughs> that's that's the needle injection of delivering the medication directly to your, your penis with a little um, puncture. Um, and it, it's a very small, you know, you may hear... Um, People talk about the Boston Clinic. That's basically what that is. is it's bypassing all the oral and the, and the blood vessels because sometimes the vessels are damaged and you're not the the pills are not able to be delivered effectively. So you can deliver that medication directly to the penis with a little with a little like a small instant type needle. That's very effective um, for a lot of men. And then you have the the last thing is the most invasive thing is the prosthesis, a penile prosthesis, and that's uh, something that is surgically inserted into the penis and and that's when you're 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 not getting any erections and you're not and you're not having re and you haven't responded to any of the the aforementioned you know you know um uh you know areas like the 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 the, the pill or the pump or the or the puncture or the penis uh the um you know the penis injection so um and that's and that's effective a penal prosthesis is effective is it's a, a, a tell men like women get breast augmentations and will not, it will not make your penis bigger. Cause that's the, the so just so you understand that what it does, the, the goal for the prosthesis is for you to be able to um, have intercourse or penetration. It gets the penis hard for, for penetration, but it will not make your penis bigger. Um, and unlike, you know, breast augmentation can. So those that's, the, the four P's for the penis. And if you remember those things, if you, the, uh, if the lifestyle changes are not effective, that that's when you can, you know, discuss this with your, with your, your local urologist. Okay. okay. Are there any other final words that you'd like to leave us with as it relates to men just taking care of their health? No, I'm just, I'm glad you gave, we had the opportunity to have this, you know, this, this discussion and, and, yeah. and it's straightforward. I, I, enjoy talking about men's health and uh and it's something that i think it's um as i get older and i am able to um if i can i like to try to help disseminate good information and dispel bad information when we can especially in our community 
Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So. That's exactly why I invited you on, because I wanted to have an opportunity to speak to our community, especially our black men, and dispel some of those things I know that I've heard. So I'm sure, you know, others are probably feeling that way. So you are going to definitely in men that view this episode and hopefully they will do um, the things that you recommended and make sure that they're taking care of their health. To all my men out there, I hope that if something in this um, episode that Dr. Bryant stated, it resonates with you or you're experiencing some of these issues, I hope you really take it seriously and you go and you speak to your provider and take care of your health. Make sure you get the issue addressed, whether it's, you know, you're experiencing an erectile dysfunction or whether you're experiencing issues with urinating please make sure that you go and get that checked out immediately. And then also what he said that really kind of struck me was I didn't realize the tie between some of these issues that men experience and their heart health. So two, if you have, if you are seeing a cardiologist, if you already have been diagnosed with some type of heart issue, please make sure that you continue to take care of your health, see your provider, get your annual checkups, and if you have medication that you should be taking, please take it on a regular basis. We love you. We care about you. And we want you to be around for a very long time. So I hope you all have enjoyed this episode of Black Facts. Please like, share, and subscribe at the button down below. And make sure to join me on another episode of Black Facts so we can all know the facts. Take care, everyone.